Hello and welcome to uh, today's GCV Analytics webinar. It's been several weeks for all parts of the economy experiencing unusual developments uh, related to demand and supply shocks uh, because of the coronavirus. Media companies like Netflix and Disney have reached record subscriber growth, while other parts of consumer demand uh, have uh, started withering with people uh, kept in a lockdown. The plunging oil prices uh, we saw um, earlier uh, seem to suggest that the latter is having more of an impact on, on the economy than the former just giving boost to a few companies' stop lines. But not all seems so bleak, um, considering the relatively sanguine nature of the stock market. Um, with rises we've seen since mid-March, there seems to be a uh, some kind of a massive disconnect somewhere because it seems incredible that investors' expectations of future profits, let alone uh, survival of certain businesses, are right or that they're paying the right multiples for their earnings. But as economist John Maynard Keynes once said, the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. But those at the front line of getting what uh, we all want to where we can all buy it are even more vital in a time like this and definitely worth listening to. This is the reason why uh, we've prepared a webinar, today's webinar, on the impact of COVID-19 on the consumer and retail trends as well as the logistics that seems to be affected and how to cope with that impact from an innovation standpoint when most of demand suddenly just disappears uh, and whether onshoring of logistics will become um, a more important issue as we emerge from, from this crisis. Um, so today, um, our editor and founder and editor-in-chief, James Mawson, and I are really delighted to be hosting uh, this, uh, this webinar and this panel discussion, which was prepared in partnership with uh, law firm uh, Fager Drinker. Um, we are very thankful for Fager Drinker's uh, um, support over the years and um, in, in these uh, in these uh, challenging times. So um, a, big, a big thanks to them. And I'm really excited to be moderating this panel because um, it's a panel of actually six six uh, six guest speakers that that we have. Um, so we have uh, Aaron Van Landuit, who's managing director at Tyson Ventures, uh, Eilat Cohen Basat, um, managing director at uh, Kimberly Clark. Um, Alan Williams, uh, Manager of Corporate Development at Hormel, uh, Jay Bunty, Manager of uh, Strategy and M&A and Venture Capital at Ingredian, Robert Cha, uh, Director of Technology and Partnerships at uh, LG and Electronics, and Mark Pilstrom, uh, Partner at uh, Figure Drinker. Uh, delighted to uh, have you all here, guys. Uh, Jim, uh, welcome as well. Um, and um, let's... Glad to be here. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, so let's start with um, each each of you um, introducing yourselves uh, very briefly uh, something about your company and then we're going to start with uh, with the panel discussion. So uh, starting with Erin. Uh, sure, thanks. Um, nice to be here today. Uh, so my name is Erin Van Landewit. Um, as was mentioned, I'm with Tyson Ventures. I'm fairly new to the organization. I've been here for about five months. Um, prior to that, I have about a decade and a half of experience um, in various CPG, food and beverage, um, and consumer product um, personal care companies. Uh, most recently, I was at SC Johnson on their ventures team. So that's about me. All right. Thank you. Uh, a lot. Hi, thank you for the invitation today. Um, as you said, my name is Eilat Cohen-Bassat. I'm with uh, Kimberly Clark, uh, Fortune uh, 150 company, um, which uh, provides the essentials for a better life to all of us. Uh, I'm with the digital innovation team. We are collaborating with uh, startups and innovators all around the world. Before Kimberly Clark, I was with the telecom industry, also uh, investing and collaborating with uh, with uh, startups to create uh, uh, new digital uh, disruptions in the telecom uh, space. Mm -hmm. That's me. Thank you. Thank you a lot, uh, uh, Alan. Hi, my name is Alan Williams. Happy to be here today. Um, I'm with Hormel Foods and have been in my role for about a year. We just recently started uh, 
exploring venture capital and have been actively filling our pipeline of potential deals and working towards completion on uh, a few transactions here. Uh, mm -hmm. Prior to joining Formal, I was with a uh, law firm, Hush Blackwell, doing mergers and acquisitions and helping uh, startup companies with um, all facets of their business. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alan. Uh, um, quite a time to be uh, to be starting uh, in a position like this, right? Um, Jay, uh, you're up next. Great, thank you. Yes, Jay, Jay Bunty here um, from Ingredion. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just to give you a quick, quick, brief overview of Ingredion, we are a global ingredients provider um, with a lion's share of our products going into the food and bev space. Um, and myself specifically, I reside within our strategy group, um, which, which houses our, our, our venture investing efforts, which I lead. Um, so yeah, again, thanks for having, having me today. Um, pleasure to have you here, Jay. Thanks for, thanks for finding the time. All right. Uh, so we do have a, we do have a panel, uh, really, uh, somewhat biased and skewed towards, uh, food and uh, consumer staples, but uh, we haven't left out consumer electronics. Uh, so uh, Robert from LG Electronics. Hi, I hope everyone on this call is staying safe and healthy. Um, I'm responsible for partnerships and investments for LG Electronics uh, based in the Bay Area, California. I've uh, been with LG for 14 years in various strategic roles. Um, uh, we work mainly with startups on a variety of collaboration models, including strategic equity investments. Um, one question I do get often is, are we part of LG Tech Ventures? Uh, we're not, uh, but we work closely with that team. Uh, whereas LG Tech Ventures represent multiple LG companies and has a fund structure. I'm part of LG Electronics and we work on investment opportunities with tighter strategic coupling. Um, and uh, we, we support all current business divisions at LG Electronics, uh, as well as new business apps. Thank you for having me on this panel. Pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you for finding the time uh, in, in such challenging times. And uh, last but not least, uh, Mark, um, please introduce yourself. And once again, uh, thank you so much for supporting this webinar and, uh, and GTV. Well, it's our pleasure and thanks for organizing this uh, and for everybody taking the time out of their day to attend. Uh, so my name is Mark Pilstrom. I'm a partner with uh, Fagri Drinker. We're a 1,300-person global law firm, and I chair our venture capital practice uh, and reside out of our Minneapolis, Minnesota office in the U.S. All righty. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so guys, thank you for introducing yourselves. Um, I, I, I'd like to uh, jump straight into the discussion on some of the questions that I've prepared. So the first one, the first one I've prepared is, uh, is really uh, mostly a question to the uh, CDCs, well, the corporates uh, here on the panel. So, uh, what, what are or what were the most interesting trends that you, that you guys have seen in the areas you invest in before the pandemic, uh, whether it's in food or in consumer electronics? And uh, which of them do you think are, are going to, are you, you're going to continue to see after the pandemic, whenever, well, whenever that uh, happens to be, as it were. Um, so perhaps if we, if we start with um, Aaron, um, no, perhaps if we start with a lot because uh, because both uh, because Aaron Allen and Jay are broadly in the same food industry, whereas a lot is uh, in more like personal care. So perhaps if we start with a lot and then. OK, thank you, Kalyan. So um, actually, I, I, if I may say, we saw a kind of a reflection point, really a singularity point uh, with the with COVID-19, we'd actually created the, an acceleration and a leap of years in, in areas which we've looked in. Uh, one is in terms of consumer behaviors. I mean, like people going online immediately. I mean, from 5% in retail, it jumped enormously, like uh, thousands of uh, thousands times. Uh, and people are literally, uh, 
uh, buying uh, buying everything online, and we see it, of course, uh, um, a, a, it has a tremendous impact uh, also on supply chains, uh, and I'm sure we'll discuss it further on. But so so we see that trend on a, on a personal care and on a hygiene place. We see also uh, people uh, shifting into uh, places and creating behaviors that uh, uh, were much accelerated around personal hygiene, uh, both in homes and in uh, workplaces. And last but not least, which is uh, which is uh, I think uh, something that we've seen all the time, kind of um, a, kind of a, a, in in small in small numbers, but now it really it really uh, a burst. It is the the uh, enormous effort that is being uh, created now all around the world uh, with innovators and startups and and big companies to do what we call diagnostics at the edge. Okay, so actually to try and see how people are taking care uh, of themselves, how they diagnose themselves, how they uh, um, uh, how they how they uh, monitor their state, their health status. Um, so I think that in between these three trends that we've been monitoring for a long time, and we see now quite of an acceleration. Um, so this is what we're merely experiencing and in terms of whether it will stay so i we believe that some of the behaviors and also some of the actual the actual developments that the the, the covid 19 actually uh, accelerated will stay with us people still gonna go and be more much more active uh, uh, online we believe that they will take care of their uh, they will take care of uh, of of themselves and they will uh, consume much more, uh, much more hygiene uh, products, and I think that the, and and the fact is that the the technologies are accelerating to allow people to monitor themselves at home will certainly stay with us and impact how we see me how we see medical services, how we see care services, and how we see people people uh, monitoring their own health going forward. All right. Those are really interesting trends that seem uh, seem like uh, they're likely to uh, to be accelerated and continued. Um, and now on to the uh, food sector. Um, Aaron, um, perhaps from the perspective of uh, Tyson Ventures, um, what are some of the things that uh, that you've been seeing and that sure. you think are um, going to go on? Great question. Um, so I would echo what Eilat said about the acceleration of, um, you know, conversion to making purchases on primarily digital platforms for consumers. I do think a lot of that behavior is going to stick um, with, you know, like ordering groceries online for either delivery or no contact pickup. Um, another interesting trend that's been happening um, as it unfolds both from a regulatory perspective and a consumer demand perspective is a desire to have more transparency in supply chain and have more visibility to food safety, origin of food, things of that nature. Um, and I do think that is only going to accelerate and become more interesting and more of an imperative as consumers are really interested in understanding where their food comes from and making sure that it is safe and secure to eat. All right. Um, Alan, perhaps um, if you could uh, bring in your perspective from, um, from the point of view of Hormo. Sure. So I will echo everything that Aaron said as trends that we are also seeing at Hormel. Um, some other areas that we are um, monitoring is around um, how we think about getting our food, um, both from within the retail space. Um, we think there's going to be a very big focus on health and safety. And as we think about the packaging that we have and we think about kind of the services with some of those self-serve buffet style um, offerings within the deli space, the um, sliced meat products. How can we, as a company, start looking at ways to ensure safety and um, wholesomeness of the food that you get both from the buffet space and the deli space and looking at ways that we can protect that supply chain to make sure that people can still get those fresh offerings from the areas that they're used to. Um, in a safe and efficient way. 
All right. Um, and uh, Jay? Um... Yeah, yeah. So, so following on on some of those comments, you know, uh, from our perspective, we've really seen seen that channel shift um, from from food service um, to retail and and also, you know, institutional, for instance, school meals at schools and, and workplace cafeterias to, to, to meals at home. And um, that massive shift really having a, a significant impact on, on the supply chains. Um, and to also further in their comment, I, I think the e-commerce, you know, the, the, that, that's been an interesting case study because we've, we've also obviously seen this massive shift to e-commerce, Amazons, et cetera. Um, and historically, e-commerce has, has, has really represented a small piece of the, the total market, which has been historically controlled by supermarkets and grocery retailers. Um, so, so it isn't. It, it's an industry still, still new, I guess I'd say. And, and so, I think the long-term stickiness of the e-commerce is really going to depend on 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 how the e-commerce market infrastructure can adapt and hold up to this large increase in demand. So, I think the jury is still out there. Um, you know, what else I'd say is is, is the impact of technology um, in the current current unprecedented times. Um, obviously, we 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 all have um, seen it firsthand in, in video conference calls, Zoom, et cetera. But I think just specific to the food and beverage space, we've seen some interesting and and uh, unique uses of technology. Um, and I think one echoing um, Aaron's point of transparency in the market, uh, you know, we we've seen the increase of usage of blockchain, which has been kind of cool to see. Um, I know there was a twelve million dollar purchase of wheat. Uh, by Agricorp, one of Southeast Asia's largest food commodity traders, um, you know, last week, which was which was pretty remarkable to see. So, yeah, to answer your question, I, I see this trends are changing, and I, and I think I think there'll be some stickiness to those trends. Uh, quite a, quite an acceleration in in e-commerce, uh, um, which uh, has historically accounted for about uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 percent only of total retail um, in the US for example um, and and you also touched on technology uh, the role of technology and things like blockchain which uh, which is a really good segue to uh, um, to me asking uh, Rob about uh, the uh, sector of consumer electronics um, because it does seem like electronics and technology is what uh, is still allowing us to to work and uh, lead uh, well lead relatively normal lives as, as, as much as that uh, as that's possible uh, nowadays. So, uh, Rob, I'm really interested to hear what are the the sort of trends that you've seen and that you think are going to be accelerated and uh, you're going to continue to see in consumer electronics after after this whole thing is over. Yes, um, obviously, work from home tech um, is one area that's obviously a, a, an obvious trend, like a video conferencing uh, is taking hold and we'll probably, we'll see increased usage uh, in the post-pandemic world. Uh, I mean, my kid is taking Taekwondo lessons through Zoom, so that says it all. Right. <laughs> um, I'm also seeing a general acceleration in interest in, interest, um, in VR and AR. Um, unfortunately, LG is not active in that space, we're just monitoring um, VR and AR, but the AR solutions, AR solutions are being used by um, by even retailers to strengthen their online offerings. Uh, I see. You know, seeing com products placed virtually in your home or on your body, like virtual fitting, is a way to ha help consumers uh, make easier uh, purchasing decisions. And uh, and of course, like all industries represented on this panel, um, another obvious trend is in same in the consumer electronics industry is the transition uh, from offline retail to e-commerce. And um, I believe all of these mentioned trends uh, will likely continue. Uh, this pandemic was a boon for these technology-based offerings because they were practically force-fed uh, to a wider audience. Right. Right. Um, thank you. And uh, you, you know, uh, when it when we when we talk about investing in uh, in startups and in, in new technologies, uh, um, some of whose benefits uh, may have materialized, some of whose benefits may materialize in the future, um, it's almost inevitable to kind of ask ask you guys a question: Are any of this 
any of the trends uh, that you've invested in already uh, bringing any sort of uh, tangible benefits to your corporate parents? Uh, and uh, if they haven't yet, do you expect them to bring such benefits in the post-pandemic world? And I guess uh, since we started on technology, I guess, uh, Rob, uh, if you don't mind, we would start with you and then I'll move on to the other speakers. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, consumer electronics is not considered essential at this time. So this pandemic is sort of hammering the consumer electronics industry. Um, mm -hmm. So people are certainly using LG products more uh, sheltered in their homes, but that's not being translated to increased sales. And uh, and when it comes to these trends we're seeing, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to uh, see benefits right away um, in the short term. And uh, any benefits we see uh, seem to be dwarfed by the negative impact of the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. these, these trends, however, seem to be serving as a, a kick in the butt, you know, for various groups at, the, at headquarters, given our reliance on physical retail channels. Uh, uh, so the, the only immediate benefit that we're seeing uh, might be uh, groups at LG working on the, uh, the, our e-commerce offerings. Uh, and I noticed uh, we, we are offering like a bundle discount for work from home package uh, and, and LG.com. And, uh, and also our marketing groups are looking at AR solutions. So we're supporting them currently um, uh, because they're looking to strengthen their online presence and uh, and I'm certain these trends uh, around AR will will bring uh, tangible benefits to LGE uh, mm -hmm. going forward, even after this pandemic. I see. Thank you. And uh, now on to the food sector, uh, because um, people haven't started, haven't stopped uh, um, buying food, um, and you know, being food being a, a sort of a consumer, sort of a consumer staple. So. Um, perhaps, um, Alan, if um, if you could comment from uh, Hormel's perspective. Sure. So right now we are looking at investments within kind of the better for you and um, plant-based space. We have made one investment and that company has seen a large lift from the uh, trends that we're seeing with kind of a focus on eating at home. Um, and being able to be a shelf stable offering, definitely being able to be available both on Amazon and other e-commerce. So it's definitely seeing a great lift with um, the current trends that we're seeing. Um, it does um, kind of beg the question around how long will this better for you trend and how sticky this will be. Um, we do believe that um, with the pandemic and kind of the ads around health and wellness um, and a focal point on those pre-existing um, pre conditions being a area of concern for potentially having um, higher risks and higher uh, symptoms with the COVID virus. Um, we think people will be thinking about their health um, more holistically and food will definitely play a part there and uh, mm -hmm. we'll continue to play within that space. We can Think that'll be a trend that will be around for a, a long time yeah uh, definitely definitely um and uh, i guess uh, jay uh, from the perspective of uh, ingredient yeah yeah it, it definitely would, would would echo what went on there i mean we're seeing in the marketplace that that increased emphasis on on health and wellness um, given COVID and, and its impact, and and I think that does play play nicely into into our overall ingredients overall strategy. Um, kind of two of our two of our platform strategic specialty platforms are plant based proteins um, as well as sugar reduction, um, and, and those are those are key pillars of our, of our our venture efforts as well. So I think with that increased focus on on the health and wellness, we're we're seeing priority given given to those segments. Um, which 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 has helped and we've seen firsthand our 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 um, uh, portfolio companies as well. Right, and um, from the standpoint of the protein um, providers, um, Aaron. Sure. So there are a couple of companies in our portfolio that um, we've been able to actually 
I would say adapt a little more quickly to the changing environment because of um, one of them is actually a, a company that helps us with supplier management um, and transparency and traceability for our supply chain. Uh, they actually have a platform that has, a, yes, absolutely. It's allowed us to um, very quickly uh, find, vet, and start doing business with um, different ingredient suppliers um, or raw input suppliers that help us shift our production from more food service focused products to more retail focused products. Um, so that has helped greatly. Uh, we have another company in our portfolio that does uh, direct to consumer subscription meal service. So as you could probably imagine, um, they've right. seen a significant increase in their business. Uh, but what's really great about that is we're getting some learning about, you know, what the consumer interaction is there, the type of demands consumers have in order to make sure that that becomes a part of their ongoing um, behavior post pandemic. Um, so a really great source of, of data there. I'd say that we're not leveraging that right now, but I do foresee that giving us some efficiency. Um, and then another company uh, that's related to pathogen testing um, and does some DNA diagnostics on those pathogens. Um, there is, as you might guess, a, quite a bit of application with um, you know, previously identified contaminants that might happen in the course of our manufacturing. But now with, you know, this virus, um, that's yet another thing that we could potentially test rapidly for. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to understand, you know, what the application of that might be in our business too. So I'd say that these places where we've decided to kind of lean in a little bit more to where the market's going, we're already seeing some benefit of that. Um, and I, I only see that accelerating um, as we continue to expand the portfolio. This, so this sounds really great. It sounds like um, um, for almost all of you that there is something in your portfolio uh, that uh, could, could bring value even in, uh, in challenging times uh, of such such an exogenous shock like like this one, uh, which none of us really expected to reach uh, to reach this level. Um, but now to to bring in uh, a little bit the legal perspective, I'd like to ask uh, Mark uh, from a legal standpoint, um, what have been some of the interesting or even challenging or thorny issues? that have come up in your practice with investments in the consumer and, and retail space. If you could uh, share that with uh, with us a bit uh, pre-COVID and post-COVID <laughs> and during yeah. COVID, I, I guess I should say. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think kind of from the, uh, when I'm representing my uh, corporate venture capital clients in new investments in the space, um, one of the things we've confronted recently are some interesting rights being granted to uh, important suppliers of the prospective portfolio companies, um, including uh, exit rights, so rights of first refusal or rights of um, first negotiation in connection with a sale of the portfolio company. And as Many folks know those, particularly in the US, are, are um, some of the important rights that corporate venture capital looks to get when making a preferred investment. So we've had to navigate through some of those arrangements and, and see how we can align uh, those existing rights uh, given to the suppliers, important suppliers, with uh, our, you know, our clients' uh, wants and needs. So I'd say that from kind of the new investment uh, perspective, are, there are some thorny issues we've helped navigate. Um, and then with respect to existing portfolio companies, and, and obviously in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a lot of portfolio companies who didn't think they uh, needed to be doing any fundraising now are absolutely scrambling and uh, turning towards their uh, investors, including the CBCs, and uh, are looking to line up uh, bridge financing, uh, convertible note financing, and uh, you know, given. The, 
given the circumstances uh, and to optimize a, a return on, on those convertible note investments, um, we're having to dig a little deeper into those terms uh, because you know, the very real possibility that there may not be a follow-on financing or that mm -hmm. the portfolio company may not be able to uh, pay back the loan when uh, when due. So we've had to come up and, and address some real world scenarios with uh, you know our the, our portfolio companies with whom we're we're trying to help along, but we also need to be realistic with them as well. I see. Uh, very, very, very interesting. So, so I guess you would say that um, startups, and particularly in the U.S., are becoming more receptive to uh, hybrid or debt, uh, just uh, pure play debt financing, uh, rather than uh, just uh, the regular equity financing that they're used to raising now more than than before that that's right all right so, so that's that's really an important development because in in my impression in uh in in the united states uh it's uh like debt financing or hybrid financing in the form of convertible bonds uh, uh does tend to be kind of like not necessarily last resort but uh uh, not it's not the most preferred option among sp startup founders, uh, if, if you see what I mean, um, which, which is not necessarily the case across other geographies like uh, certain countries in Europe, for example. But uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's interesting uh, how how that that's evolved so quickly, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, and I will say it's it's not as if they're you know the angel angel investors typically oftentimes do invest in convertible note financings, but but really there, it's just part of the life cycle of the company kind of bridging to a real venture capital investment. Mm -hmm. But but here, I think it's it's kind of hitting companies at, at all different stages, not just startups. Um, and and so you you are having to dig into these terms in including you know mandatory conversion or optional conversion and, and trying to figure out appropriate valuations for optional conversions of these of these notes into equity um, but right and I and I guess that's a very very complicated task with uh, with the sort of uh, black swan that we've got at hand uh, right now yeah. um, so um, you, you did mention, uh, well, you and, and other speakers already mentioned uh, issues related to supply chains and, and suppliers. So, and that there is, there is, and there has been a lot of talk about uh, fears of supply chain disruption in uh, recent times. So whether it's in uh, in things like uh, consumer staples or consumer electronics. So I just wanted to, wanted to ask um, the. Um, the corporates here on the panel. Uh, to what extent have you seen this sort of uh, supply chain disruption issue uh, in the case of your portfolio companies, and um, how uh, how have you managed to help them cope with it? Uh, because as corporates, you are more uniquely positioned than uh, than you know a traditional VC firm, which may not have uh, the wherewithal to do that. So um, perhaps if we start with uh, Alot. Yep. Um, so I I kind of want to refer, if I may, to the uh, disruptions in supply chain that we we also uh, experience as you know big corporates, not just the uh, portfolio companies. I think that the whole uh, supply chain landscape is changing dramatically, um, and and you see all types of of uh, what used to be experiments before becoming real life scenarios. Uh, and you see a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, explosion. I want to say in uh, in from one end, uh, you see a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, issues that are happening in the supply chain side in terms of in terms of how do you actually produce everything because uh, China well, whatever happened in China and all the eastern part of the world. And and on the other hand, you see all types of new supply chain uh, capabilities and in, in what we call last mile 
uh, developing really, really quickly. Um, so from a, from a corporate perspective, we, we see a lot of turbulence from both sides. And, and I want to say that in each case, and I see it throughout the industry, not just with us, that everything that they, all, all the focus across all the CPG sector was like onto the basics, like consumers went to the basics, also corporates went to the basics and completely focused on creating what they know to create best. Uh, that's immediately uh, implied to, to any uh, startup partners and, on the, and or investments that any startup that wasn't on the critical path needed automatically to change change gears and change uh, and, and, and sometimes you know kind of um, kind of minimize activity and as uh, as big corporates who want to strategic investors who want uh, those companies to stay fit so we're really advising on them to kind of uh, kind of uh, really minimize all expenses minimize all 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 excess of, of anything that does not uh, does not get them into um, um, uh, I want to say any type of uh, unnecessary unnecessary um, operational operational cost in order to to wait and to see how what will happen after after this turbulence uh, is is done. Um, and I and I think that we see that across the board. On the other hand, we have uh, we have uh, uh, partners that are uh, truly benefiting from from everything that we said before. Uh, the online explosion, the the fact that people are going um, uh, hygiene, fresh food, everything like that. And so over there, we see peak and we see great demand that they cannot even answer. So I hope that answers that. Yeah, uh, it definitely definitely does. Um, Aaron, um, perhaps um, from the standpoint of uh, Tyson uh, Tyson Ventures and uh, some of the some of the exciting uh, uh, company cases that you already mentioned, uh, or perhaps some other other companies in your portfolio, have you seen the supply chain uh, disruption or um, any sort of supply chain problems uh, being mm -hmm. being detected? Sure, you know, as as Ela just said, it it it's pretty universal. No matter the size of your company, uh, the level of disruption that's happening right now. Um, I think, you know, being larger corporations, the access that we have to certain resources, even ones as simple as data, market information. Um, I've been sharing a lot of information with our portfolio companies related to changing market dynamics, trends, data on, you know, how to overcome issues with labor. I mean, any of those things that they don't necessarily have access to. I think sometimes we forget how easy it is to have access to syndicated data or to just go do a data poll out of one of the systems that we, you know, spend quite a bit of money to have access to. Um, but the portfolio companies don't have that. So that's one of the ways that, you know, we're helping them understand market dynamics and potentially how to adapt and overcome those things that their businesses are seeing. I see. And um, um, perhaps Jay, if um, if you could share your perspective on the matter. Sure, sure. Um, thankfully, this thus far in the pandemic world, um, we haven't seen any major negative supply issues um, at our, our portfolio companies, which is good. Um, I do think the more frightening potential may be still yet to come in the food supply chain and, and that being the, the prospect of, of countries potentially shutting down their borders uh, for food trade as a measure of um, domestic food security, um, which we haven't seen that yet, but, but if that does happen, it could, could cause some serious disruption. So I think we'll, we'll wait to see how that plays out. Um, I do think, you know, as, as mentioned, the, the good news is as a, a corporate sponsor to, to some of our, our portfolio companies, um, we as Ingredion, you know, have a, a global and complex supply chain and, and many resources in our supply chain departments um, globally. So when, when issues do arise, I think it's, it's really our, our place to step in and provide those subject matter experts and that, that knowledge transfer to, to assist in, in combating some of these disruptions. Right, and Alan? 
Yeah. Um, so our first uh, company has a very uh, global supply chain network that um, luckily we were lucky and we didn't have that big of a disruption through COVID despite having some products being made in China um, and building up uh, supply and inventory around the world before the uh, COVID virus hit and before the uh, shutdown with Chinese New Year, um, we were spared from some of the disruptions that some of the other competitors that have similar products made in China experienced. Um, but as a strategic being able to assist with kind of the logistics of getting products from one place to another, when there are some tight regulations, when there are tightening of uh, restrictions, and when there are um, shortages of um, space to get product out, when um, boats start going back and forth between China and the US, um, being able to get them in contact with some of our uh, um, logistics folks and being able to work through some of those challenges definitely was a benefit of having a corporate arm being the main investor in the, our portfolio company. All right, and um, Robert, uh, from the standpoint of uh, some uh, of, uh, of your portfolio companies, have they experienced this sort of uh, supply chain disruption? Uh, have you been able to help them in some way tackle it? Um, so supply chain issues, uh, doesn't seem to be as critical um, to our portfolio companies uh, you know, compared to the food or consumer staples industry. Um, but we did notice uh, that some of our com portfolio companies are experiencing impact to uh, supply lead times. Um, after all, some of them use hardware um, coming from uh, from China. Um, uh, as a result, you know, we are mainly concerned about potential um, delayed plans or deliverables um, when it comes to strategic implications. Uh, so we're trying our best to set the right ex expectations um, between LG headquarters and portfolio companies. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm welcome to more ideas on um, how we can help them cope with the supply lead times. But uh, our expectation is that the uh, in this industry, it's, it's probably not that critical and uh, it'll be a more short-term lived uh, concern uh, when it comes to electronics supply chain. Um, but I, I, as a sidebar though, uh, one interesting sidebar is that um, um, some people asked me asked me about LG Electronics and uh, how, um, our, how we can sort of become opportunistic in, the, in our own manufacturing, like modifying our manufacturing to uh, make PPEs or ventilators, uh, which was an interesting question. Um, but uh, a lot of LG Electronics uh, manufacturing is automated, so I'm not sure how we can be quick to be opportunistic in this space. Um, but uh, but uh, we are seeing uh, some of some companies in the manufacturing, especially hardware manufacturing space, uh, where they are retooling their manufacturing to support new opportunities in this uh, pandemic. I see. Um, yeah, the, there's probably go, going to be a lot of a lot of new opportunities that might arise, uh, even from the standpoint of uh, of corporate venturing. So that was uh, one of the next questions that I wanted to um, ask you guys. Um, do you do you think uh, um, do you think you will find new opportunities to uh, invest in during this uh, this uh, downturn, which is uh, you know, inevitable pretty much uh, all across the globe. And uh, because clearly I believe that will put uh, downward pressure on valuations of uh, certain startups. So uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, Robert, if you could um, give, your, uh, give us uh, your take on, on the issue first. Yes, um, so LG Electronics, uh, has been reconfiguring our priorities uh, even before this downturn. Um, but uh, this downturn will help us focus more attention uh, into areas like services. Um, so LG is uh, kind of late to the party, you know, when it comes to um, you know, other companies in the space. Um, but uh, we're looking at services in two areas mainly, uh, first being in the, in the home. Uh, we're trying to leverage our strength as a uh, household brand. Um, 
services that can be delivered to the home, uh, whether it's uh, entertainment, connected fitness, uh, grocery deliveries. Um, we're actively looking into this space, um, looking into opportunities um, that may arise um, from uh, this pandemic, um, but also, you know, there's renewed interest from headquarters to look into uh, services that can be delivered to the home and, and see how LG can play a role in that, in that area. Um, right. Another area that we're looking at is uh, delivering services to the car of the future as well. Um, this is uh, related to our recent launch of uh, WebS 1.0. Um, uh, it's not specifically related to pandemic, uh, but uh, I just mentioned it uh, because these are the two areas that we're looking at services to the home and collect the services to the car. Mm -hmm. I see. And uh, from the standpoint of uh, boot, um, Aaron, Alan, Jay, um, would uh, any of you like to comment on uh, on new opportunities you might uh, you think you might see in the downturn? Sure. Um, this is Aaron. So I would I've been accused of being an eternal optimist. I think there's no difference here. Um, you know, with every challenge, um, you know, opportunity, if you're willing to, to do the work and look for it. Uh, I do think that this particular time in history is helping make us very aware of some of the, I would say, less than well-developed parts of our supply chain. Um, and our, you know, end to end from procurement to delivery to consumer, like where the weak links in that chain are, so to speak. Um, so I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of opportunity specifically for corporates because we're already seeing, as I'm sure my other colleagues are, a significant amount of, you know, drying up of capital. Um, so a lot of, you know, traditional VCs um, are, being, I would say, um, very cautious. Uh, we're taking a little bit of a wait and see approach in the immediate term, but as corporates, I think we have a unique position in that we have probably more ready and more consistent access to capital to invest than I would say those who aren't backed by a corporate do. So I do think there's a significant amount of opportunity specifically for CVCs coming out of this. Um, and I do think there's an opportunity for, you know, as was mentioned a little bit earlier uh, by Mark in the types of deal structures and terms um, that we could potentially be willing to ask for and be able to get um, because there is going to be a difference in, um, you know, availability of capital for founders. I see. And um, a lot, uh, sorry, um, was it Alan or Jay? Yeah, I was going to agree with everything that Aaron said. I think in times of uh, troubles like this, where a lot of uh, problems are being exposed within our supply chain, within the product offerings, within our ability to switch from food service offerings to retail offerings, um, people are, have a lot of time on their hands to come up with solutions. And I think we're going to see a lot of new creative solutions out there and people with ideas that are going to be looking for capital to invest in and being some of the uh, corporate uh, investors we see the issues in our supply chain we uh, will be looking for those solutions and we have a very or at Hormel we have a very good uh, balance sheet and we're ready willing and able to make those investments and solutions to the problems that have been exposed from this uh, economic downturn in this pandemic. All right, um, Jay, anything to add? Yeah, yeah, just, just adding on to that, you know, I think as, as touched on, we, we've obviously seen some some elevated and, and some wild valuations and, and multiples, both in the VC worlds and the, the M&A worlds at the tail end of this, you know, call it 10 year bull market we've been in. So I think that's a byproduct of, of some of the liquidity and dry powder that's been in the market. Um, so I think, you know th this inflection point where we're starting to see that that pendulum swing a little bit um just given the, the broad uncertainties that COVID has brought upon us so in in all of that i think you know as mentioned we as corporates are in a unique position here and and i think we need to 
we need to remind ourselves sometimes of the the why behind our, our corporate venturing thesis and remember that that um that, that why generally remains true even even in a pandemic so if anything there there may be a bit less deal competition out there out there in the marketplace right and from the standpoint of personal care products uh, a lot yeah well i totally agree with everything that was said uh, by my colleagues here um i think that uh, that this uh, period uh, this time that we're going uh, going is uh, is going to show us uh, actually showing us already uh, all types of things that we need to uh, fix all types of things that uh, that uh, challenges that we have uh, whether in operations in value propositions and whatever and on the other hand this time suppresses a lot of new ideas for many many people um, and we see also I think that one thing that we see that uh, that is kind of uh, more fortified now with uh, with uh, with the whole COVID-19 thing is we see consortium uh, being formed around investments around new innovations and so forth that weren't there before and I think it's a it's a great time to co-invest and in the in the in the just somehow in 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 normal I want to say in not that uh, high valuations um, in things that will help us all uh, you know in the future so I think that from that end from the fact is that one we know we 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 can see very clearly where the where the challenges are on the other end there are great opportunities outside that that find great partners to invest with i think it uh, poses a great time for cvcs um in terms of investment great great and speaking of co-investments i would like to briefly engage mark again from um from a legal point of view um what are some of the possible solutions uh to help portfolio companies weather this storm um that you have that you have advised your clients to employ, whether it's government support or syndication or or other, could you please um, tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Um, well, well, first, whether we're advising the company itself or or our CBC clients in relation to their portfolio companies, um, we're really telling them to make sure that they're taking all government available funds. Uh, Possible. So in the U.S., uh, you know, we those at at my firm and myself have been spending a lot of time working with companies and obtaining SBA PPP funds uh, and going through uh, that analysis and application process. So that's first uh, to, to weather the storm, and particularly for non-essential businesses. I think uh, second, we've been working closely with our startup companies to try to, and I think uh, Elat uh, mentioned this, try to get as efficient as possible. So um, in addition to unfortunate uh, employee furloughs that are going on, making sure you're cutting expenses or renegotiating um, expenses, uh, leases, payment terms, as much as possible. Everything's on the table. Um, and many of our uh, non-essential business clients um, have uh, been able to make great headway on that front. Uh, and then I'd also say, and I think Aaron alluded to this, um, working closely with your investors uh, and your board and leaning on them and trying to get as much information out of them as possible to help uh, your business succeed. And I, I have several uh, uh, emerging companies that are holding weekly board calls uh, to keep everybody updated on progress and to get new thoughts and opinions on a very consistent basis. Um, and then, and then finally, it really is making sure the CEO of these um, and the, the leadership of these companies are doing the best that they can uh, to view this situation, albeit bad, as 
you know, as an opportunity to try to stay positive for the health, for the mental well-being of their uh, workforce. And, and so we'll all come out of this ahead in the end if we plant the right seeds now. All right, um, conscious. We are almost uh, reaching the top of the hour. So, uh, Jim, I, I think you were uh, you were keen to ask a few questions as well. Well, I'm mindful of time, and I, I don't want to sort of run into people's day. I mean, it's been fascinating to hear so many of the insights, particularly. You know, I, I think this sort of Jay's point around the potential disruption in the supply chain and the implications if food is disrupted, let alone water supplies, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a big sort of shock, I think, when the sort of globalization goes into potential reverse, given how disparate uh, supply chains are. But uh, in terms of healthcare, food, water and, and the rest of it, you know, it's a, it's a really sort of uh, primary issue given the country like the UK alone imports about half of its food. So um, so I won't ask a question now apart from to say thank you and uh, perhaps Kalyan if you've got a, a minute or two you just want to sort of provide some context to the sort of work that they're doing that might say in terms of the data might show some of the investments and exits uh, that's been happening in this sector given that you, you've very kindly written up the sector report for the April issue of Global Corporate Ventures. So perhaps if you can spare a couple of minutes just to run through that and uh, and then we'll, we'll sure. head towards the close. Sure. Um, all right. So um, I'll, I'll just go, go over those slides as briefly as I can. In terms of uh, data that we saw on uh, Q1, um, if we look at it on a on a quarterly basis, uh, there does seem to be a drop uh, in Q1 versus uh, Q1 this year versus Q1 last year. Although um, not, it, it doesn't seem to be as as extreme in terms of number of deals, or um, it probably looks a bit more extreme in terms of uh, total dollars in those deals. Um, however, if we look at it on a monthly basis, uh, there's definitely a much more serious uh, serious drop. An activity that we that we see here. Um, in terms of the exits, uh, we uh, funnily enough uh, track the same number of exits uh, uh, this quarter as uh, um, Q1 uh, last year, um, and uh, even slightly more in terms of the total dollars. However, uh, it must be kept in mind uh, that uh, two of the two of the exits. Um, were involving uh, two very large acquisitions that were uh, that were agreed and, and announced. So one is uh, Intuit's uh, 7.1 billion uh, dollar acquisition of Credit Karma, and the other one was uh, Visa acquiring uh, Pled. So um, so so yeah, the, the you know the, the, there's no there's no no significant effect on the exits yet that we've seen, but we'll probably uh, we'll we'll be likely to see that in Q2. Um, it, it's it's what what I I would expect. Um, then uh, in terms of the consumer consumer sector um, data that I prepared, uh, it, I'm, uh, some of these some of these points uh, were, were really really touched on uh, in detail by our speakers in terms of the digitization of supply chain in terms of uh, um, you know things like uh, e-commerce um, being um, disrupting the whole landscape in terms of uh, demand for healthier food. So all of that was already touched upon. Currently, the sector is plagued by short-term concerns on the supply chain. So I'm, I'm not going to dwell too much on it. Uh, in terms of investments on a year-on-year -year basis, we did see uh, a bit of a, a bit of a drop year-on-year -year basis for 2019 versus 2018, as you can see. Also, a further drop uh, in, in dollar value, which does suggest there were some downward um, pressures on, on valuations even pre-COVID-19. Um, so um, we're yet to see um, how things will unfold uh, subsequently. Um, in terms of uh, the exits, uh, we tracked 31 exits uh, at, um, in la last year. So um, obviously, um, you know, the, that, that number might change uh, this year given the crisis we are in, but uh, there might be some great opportunities too, so we are yet to see about that. And in terms of consumer funding initiatives, we did see uh, more um, sort of corporate-backed funding initiatives, whether it's accelerators, new new launch CVC units, or um, VC funds with corporate LPs. We did see that grow. Um, in, in particular, funds that are um, that are interested and do invest in uh, in, in the consumer space. So that's uh, something um, something uh, 
hopefully positive for for us uh, looking forward and with that i kind of conclude my uh my data presentation but just very quickly i hope i haven't taken up too much time uh jim you want to take the word and uh just mention a few things about uh, our organization and uh our events yeah sure thank you very much and thanks all obviously for the hard work that's gone into preparing this and doing the reports and the data everything you do can and as part of the wider team it's much appreciated so um in terms of global core prevention the data is is just one part of what the output from the the news uh site brings globalcoreprevention.com we obviously do a couple of other publications one looking at universities and how they support students and faculty spin-ups and startups and one more around governments and the sort of sustainable development goals through um, which we call global impact venturing. Within GCV, obviously we have a membership group which we call GCV Connect uh, as part of the Leadership Society and the Connect platform allows corporates to talk to each other in many ways and swap portfolio companies. Um, and, uh, and then the academy provides some of the sort of training and sort of professional development piece. And uh, we do a number of events, obviously some of them are on hold at the moment, given the coronavirus, uh, but we do them around the world, whether it's New York and Houston and California and North America, through to Sao Paulo and Brazil for LATAM, uh, UK, Germany, Switzerland, Spain, uh, for Europe primarily. And, uh, and then Japan and other places in Asia. But the thing I'm most excited about actually over the next couple of weeks, we're looking forward to our digital forum, which will be a first for us. We've done obviously these types of webinars and sort of remote discussions, uh, but the conferences that we have been doing, which brings together the sort of main corporates with their portfolio companies, we're taking virtual. Uh, and so I'm super excited uh, to be announcing that. It will be the 3rd and 4th of June. Um, and it will, the idea behind it is very much is to replicate the experience that you have from attending, having the roundtables of discussions on best practices, you know, how portfolio companies are doing and what's going on there. Uh, and it's going to be really cool. It's very interactive. Uh, we've been working with a great group of people who will be both on the corporate venture capital side and around open innovation challenges. So what are the short term needs of the corporates and how entrepreneurs can help as well as the potential deal flow that might flow from that so do check it out uh, gcvdigitalforum.com and uh, see you all there virtually if not in person anymore and then finally we have our uh, crisis forum poll uh, which is in the chat function if you have a look at there uh, but it's surveymonkey.com slash r slash gcv covid19 survey so do check that out it's a couple of questions won't take more than two minutes or so to respond but it will help us get a sense of what what you guys are all and uh, are being affected by now. So thanks to everyone for this. I'll hand back to Kalyan for the final word, but I'll just also thank all the panelists and Mark as a sponsor and host uh, for, for a great discussion. Kalyan. Um, once again, uh, on my behalf, on behalf of uh, GCV, a uh, uh, big, uh, big thank you to uh, all the panelists today. Uh, Thank you for taking the time um, to be on this panel. Um, it's a truly delightful experience to uh, to have moderated this uh, this uh, this discussion, and and particularly uh, a discussion with six panelists, uh, which which is somewhat unusual for for a webinar, or at least it was up until <laughs> very recently. Um, so so thank you very much for that once again. And um, as uh, as for as for the for our audience. Um, uh, thank you very much for attending uh, this live and um, we will be um, uploading the slides and the video recording on our YouTube channel. Uh, stay tuned for our our next uh, next webinars uh, on the COVID crisis and uh, our uh, following webinars on uh, other other sectors. So uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, stay safe and, and sane wherever you might be in the world. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>